Okay, I think we're going to get started. So hi, everyone. Thank you, as always, for joining. Um, just some housekeeping items before we begin. Um, of course, you'll be muted until after the presentation, but you'll have an opportunity to ask questions following. You can either use the raise hand icon on the bottom, or if you'd rather type your question or comment, you can do so using the chat icon. So today we're lucky to have Dr. Arjun Maserker back again. Uh, Dr. Maserker is a physician scientist with a focus on the mechanisms, biomarkers, and therapeutics related to early Alzheimer's disease. Um, he received both his MD as well as his PhD from Yale University and completed both his residency and fellowship at Columbia. So at MIU, Dr. Maserker wears many hats. He's an assistant professor of neurology and physiology, um, an attending neurologist here at the Barlow Center, uh, Center, an investigator at the Neuroscience Institute and our clinical core leader for the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So thank you, Dr. Maserker. Thank you for that nice introduction and thanks for having me. Um, and just a caveat, I am presenting this through my phone so I will do my best to strain my eyes and see my slides on my uh, iPhone screen. Um, and so either Ashley or Gloria will advance the uh, slides. So uh, I wanted to talk today about the science and medicine of, of memory. Um, you know, for, there may be some of you have heard this talk before and so it'll be a refresher. And for those who haven't, it'll be a good introduction to uh, you know, this, this field and uh, the important um, concepts. So first, uh, we'll talk about the science uh, of memory. Uh, next slide. So one way to think about memory is the office analogy. I often use this analogy to describe to patients um, how I think about memory from a scientific perspective. Um, the definition of memory is a process by which knowledge is encoded, one, stored, two, and later retrieved, three. It's a three-step process. And so the office analogy is uh, basically that the information to be uh, remembered is a file. Then you have to uh, put that information to the file. So that's encoding. Then you have to bring it, step two, to a the file cabinet for memory storage. And later on, when you need that information, you need to be able to go to that file cabinet uh, efficiently and get that information back. Next slide. And so it's important to realize that memory is only one aspect of thinking or cognition. There are a lot of forms of thinking that uh, we use in everyday life, uh, and, there, and these same forms of thinking can go awry due to disease or aging. So beyond memory, there's attention and concentration, there's planning and organization, there's language, and many, many, many other uh, forms of, of cognition. Um, and so any one of these, if they are affected, can look like uh, a memory problem. You know, for example, you can't, if you're not paying attention properly, it may seem you have a memory problem. If you don't organize that file, uh, that initial file, you'll have a memory problem. If you can't understand what someone is saying because of a language issue, then you also are not gonna remember that information. And so it's important for um, everyone to sort of realize that memory is not uh, something that happens in isolation in the brain. Uh, next slide. And so there are different kinds of memory. Um, one way to divide up memory is by the time scale. So there's short-term memory and there's long-term memory. Um, the difference between short-term and long-term, well, it's a little bit of a semantic issue. Short term definitely would be five minutes, uh, maybe something that happened yesterday, uh, maybe something that happened last week. And long term memory, we're talking about the order of you know months ago or longer, uh, and certainly biographical information. 
But even then, you can divide up uh, memory into declarative memory and non-declarative memory. And declarative memory really means information about people, places, and things, um, meaning the identity of acquaintances, family, and friends, uh, where you have been to, uh, and items, uh, what those items are, where they are. And then there's non-declarative memory, which is a little bit more abstract conceptually, um, but one form of declar non-declarative memory is procedural memory. So there are certain things that we learn and remember how to do uh, from the very day that we're born. Uh, we learn how to um, feed ourselves. We learn how to tie our shoes and ride a bike. Um, sometimes we learn things that we don't want to learn, like biting our nails. Um, so, so that's procedural memory, skills and habits. Uh, there's associative learning um, that's conditioning. So the famous example is, you know, Pavlov's dog, where, you know, it was the dog was uh, learned to associate an auditory stimulus with with being fed, and so when that auditory ring was given, the dog sort of expected that that food would come and, and would salivate. And so there are, there are forms of associative learning that that we that we go through, uh, both in a positive way and, and in a negative way. Um, and then there's non-associative learning, which is sort of kind of a backwards uh, learning or a, an appropriate forgetting, learning to forget. And so that's the terms are habituation and sensitization. And so one example is in this cartoon, this uh, woman is in Central Park. She's uh, reading her book uh, quite peacefully. And she sort of probably was bothered by all the commotion going on behind her. But gradually, she sort of starts to... Um, become desensitized or habituate, get used to the barking dog, the man on the phone, and all the other noises around her. Uh, next slide. And so what's quite interesting is that decades of neuroscience research has really revealed that all these types of memory are related to specific structures and specific connections between brain structures which is really interesting because then that gives us um, kind of a good handle on how, how diseases might affect various types of memory and also how we can improve it. Um, so for example, declarative memory uh, for people, places, and things, that is classically related to the temporal lobe, which is on the sides of our brain, and specifically the hippocampus, which I'll delve into more later. Uh, when it comes to the various forms of non-declarative memory, uh, memory for skills and habits, the procedural memory uh, apparently is, is, uh, relies on the striatum, which is a, a structure deep inside the brain. Uh, and associative learning, uh, or like conditioning, relies on structures like the amygdala and the cerebellum, which is in the back of the brain, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Now, when it comes to declarative memory uh, and specifically short-term memory uh, of, of people, places, and things, the structure that has really gained a lot of attention uh, is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a small structure. Uh, it's on both sides of the brain. It's on the sides. Uh, and, and it sort of looks like if you extract it, it kind of looks like a seahorse which is what I'm showing in the picture there to the right. And so that's why it's called the hippocampus. It it's comes from the, um, the Greek for uh, 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 seahorse. And the reason why we think the hippocampus is really important for short-term memory is from a very famous research uh, volunteer. Um, and uh, his uh, initials are HM. And um, he was, as a child suffering from intractable seizures that were arising from his temporal lobe. And back then, uh, they didn't know the, the function of this part of the brain, but they knew his seizures were coming from there. So he had surgery to remove that part of his brain. Uh, and while he was cured of his seizures, what they realized was that he was never able to make new memories 
Uh, and so after his doctors realized this, he uh, was uh, very altruistic enough to volunteer for uh, research studies, and he was studied for decades uh, up until his death uh, just a few years ago. And what, so what, what we found out was that um, his memory loss was related to the removal of his hippocampus. And so while he would retain a lot of the memories he had before the surgery, biographical data, who his parents were, other uh, people, other skills and habits that he had learned as a child, he was never able to make new memories. He was, had a very difficult time learning. And so every time the research uh, team would come in, they would have to reintroduce themselves and sort of remind him that uh, he, was, he was doing a study and that he was okay with doing the study. Um, next slide. And once the hippocampus was um, determined to be critically important for short-term memory, uh, the neuroscience field then decided to study the hippocampus at a cell biological level and a molecular level. And what has been found is that the hippocampus in particular uh, is very uh, prone to a phenomenon uh, called long-term uh, plasticity or long-term potentiation that involves a strengthening of the connections between its inherent brain cells. And so what they've found is that with the right amount of stimulation, um, the connections between brain cells of the hippocampus can actually become stronger. And so the idea is that when information from that experience going on uh, is coming through the hippocampus, somehow that makes the connection stronger and that underlies the memory uh, of that event, that uh, piece of data. And what this, what this process boils down to is an electrochemical interaction, which is shown in the box, that involves a lot of different molecules and involves calcium coming into the cell. Uh, it involves expression of new genes stimulated by that calcium activity and other enzymatic processes. And the result is some sort of long-term change in the brain network that preserves the memory of that piece of data. Next slide. So now that we've covered the very basics of, of thinking and memory, uh, we can now turn to the uh, medical aspect of memory. Next slide. Now, you could think about memory disorders in two ways. Uh, there are certainly diseases of losing memory, losing memories of things that are important or that have emotional value to us, like uh, memories related to our family or friends, uh, memories that are related to our job, uh, being able to function. Um, there's also the flip side. There's also memory disorders uh, related to not being able to forget those things that are very traumatic, um, like PTSD, for example. So I'm not gonna talk about that uh, latter form of memory disorder. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna talk about the former because that's sort of the expertise that I have and is very relevant to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Next slide. One thing that uh, we, we need to keep in mind uh, when we think about memory, the hippocampus, and diseases uh, that destroy the hippocampus is that the hippocampus is an organ, just like any other in the body. It has to interface with the rest of the organs in the body. It has um, arteries and veins coursing through it, as shown here. So it is an organ as well as a seed of part of our, our being, our consciousness, our, our you know, uh, who we are. Uh, and in Alzheimer's disease, for example, there is a shrinkage uh, of the hippocampus as shown in the middle uh, figure there. And then if you look uh, really close under the microscope, 
we'll see that the, the shrinkage of the hippocampus in Alzheimer's disease uh, associates with uh, pathology. And that's sort of the dark staining uh, shown in the uh, rightmost slide. And so that the, the things that are stained dark there are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease itself. So the teardrop shaped um, items are tangles, that's tau pathology, that's within the brain cells themselves. And that's sort of that fluffy uh, stained structure uh, on the outside of the cells uh, is the amyloid in the form of an amyloid plaque. And so the hippocampus uh, is affected in, in, in Alzheimer's disease, we think, by these tangles and plaques, which result in its decay. Uh, and then that leads to short-term memory loss. Next. But it's important to remember that not all memory loss is Alzheimer's disease. If we go back to my office analogy, um, first is that the memory, quote unquote, memory loss that someone experiences could actually be related to the uh, first step or the third step in creating a memory. And so when it's the uh, encoding of the information or the retrieval of the information respectively, there are a variety of conditions that can affect that that are not Alzheimer's disease. For example, mood disorders, uh, sleep disorders, uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, non-Alzheimer's dementias, like related to Parkinson's disease, um, as we know, as I showed before, the hippocampus is a tissue that gets uh, blood flow. So blood flow problems can cause um, uh, a malfunctioning of the memory, the one, two, three memory process, diabetes, endocrine disorders, and vitamin deficiencies. And so those will affect the first and the third steps. When it comes to that middle step, really the storage of the memory that's really centered on the hippocampus and diseases that destroy or uh, cause damage to the hippocampus. And then we, that's when we're really uh, concerned about Alzheimer's disease or trauma, stroke, or seizures, or other conditions that specifically affect the hippocampus itself. Next slide. And the other thing to remember is that not all memory loss is memory loss, as I mentioned. So when, uh, when I evaluate a patient that, or a family member that, that tells me that the patient is experiencing memory loss, I have to ask questions to really figure out, um, is it just memory loss? Um, is, it, is it actually explained by deficits in attention or organization or language um, or things that affect those things? Uh, like hearing. So it's really important to uh, understand uh, memory from a global point of view. Next slide. Also remember that not all memory loss is abnormal. So as we get older, uh, unfortunately we do lose some of our cognitive abilities uh, mildly. Um, classically, we have a little bit more trouble with multitasking. We may even have a little bit of trouble with words or names. I often hear about not being able to remember the name of that actor or actress, not being able to remember that name of the restaurant. Um, but the important thing is it doesn't impact the day-to-day -day function. It's not consistent. Um, and, you know, typically on a, a brain scan, for example, here I'm showing an MRI, we won't really see um, specific uh, destruction in the brain. What we see on an MRI with normal aging is a gradual shrinkage of the whole brain uniformly. Yes, the hippocampus gets a little bit smaller, but so does the front of the brain and the back of the brain. And so when I do an MRI in a patient, um, I sort of look for the uniformity of of the brain shrinkage. If there are particular regions that are shrinking more than others, then I get a little bit more concerned that something might, something else might be going on. But normal aging, um, it's there. We, we, it's, a, it's a separate area of study. 
Uh, we don't exactly know the mechanisms for that. Perhaps we'll come up with a treatment for that separately. Um, and, it, and, and the decline in normal aging is important to study because we know that getting older is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and, and related disorders. Uh, now, suffice it to say that we also get better at certain things with aging too. Um, you know, we do develop more maturity through experience. We're probably better with making wise decisions and so on and so forth. So I don't necessarily, um, you know, I drew normal aging as a downward line in terms of memory, but in certain aspects, um, you know, there's actually an upward line in other aspects of, of um, cognition. Next slide. Um, another form uh, or another stage of memory loss is called mild cognitive impairment. Um, and here is where the memory or, or other cognitive uh, problem is a bit more consistent. It's happening every day. Every day you notice it or every day the family member or friend notices it. Um, you know, it, it may be related not necessarily to memory, but also to language or organization or even spatial awareness. Um, but the key thing here that's different from dementia is that there's still very little impact on daily function. Someone with mild cognitive impairment or MCI could theoretically still be working, still doing their, all of their household management, um, albeit with either no difficulty or maybe getting a, a, just a little bit of, of um, uh, uh, assistance. Um, the, the reason why this stage was defined is that we do believe that a subset of MCI patients uh, are vulnerable to then developing Alzheimer's disease, dementia in the future, and and other or other dementias. Um, but there, and so it, you know, then then it's it's someone where we would want to investigate uh, the further biological causes, some of which are treatable. And here on the MRI scan, we start to see a little bit more of a more focused um, a shrinkage of of the hippocampus itself. For example, if it's Alzheimer's driven. As, as shown in the, in the figure. Next slide. Now, when it comes to dementia, which is the stage after MCI, again, this is a consistent problem. Um, there's dependence on others. It really impacts uh, daily function, uh, first with household management and occupation, and later on with basic um, activities of daily living, for example, those related to personal hygiene and feeding. Um, again, there can be non-memory forms of dementia, not, not all of them are driven by Alzheimer's disease, but still, uh, and in very rare cases, there may, be, there may be treatable forms. And here, when we look at the MRI, um, on average, the MRI appears a little bit uh, worse. So you'd see a little bit more shrinkage of the, if it's Alzheimer's driven, a bit more shrinkage of the, of the hippocampus, and maybe even shrinkage of other uh, parts of the brain, the frontal lobe or the parietal lobe and back. Next slide. So the way I look at uh, evaluating uh, memory or other thinking problems in older age is first to identify and fix the fixable thing. Uh, we know that in terms of Alzheimer's and the other neurodegenerative diseases, we are working on trying to find treatments, trying to find things that will slow down the disease, but we haven't found anything um, that is uh, you know, universally accepted and, and as, as, a, as a true uh, uh, cure or disease-modifying therapy. Um, and so um, the... the key thing is to fix the fixable. So what I try to do is look at the various components of the, in this case, the memory uh, impairment, try to identify the uh, fixable or reversible causes at each of these stages and do those in parallel to, you know, investigating, you know, any other sort of neurodegenerative uh, cause. So for example, looking closely at mood and sleep, uh, looking at vascular risk factors like blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, um, checking a thyroid level, checking a B, vitamin B12 level, and so on and so forth. So a lot of these medical things 
uh, and psychiatric things uh, which can be treated can can make a big difference in um, this loop from one this this chain from one to two to three. Next slide. And so one way to categorize these fixable or modifiable factors uh, is as follows. So we can talk about lifestyle, we can talk about medical problems, and lastly, we can talk about medications themselves. Uh, next slide. So in terms of lifestyle, <clears throat> one important uh, component that we've learned a lot about in recent years is exercise, specific aerobic exercise. Uh, we think that exercise is, is good for the brain because it increases the blood flow to the memory centers. It may help grow new neurons, brain cells in the memory centers. It helps our mood and sleep, which in turn will help memory. It's not clear exactly how much to do, but I think about 20 minutes a day of you know, a brisk walk is, is perfectly fine. Next slide. In terms of diet, the Mediterranean diet has probably the most data in support of its role in um, uh, preventing memory decline. Uh, and the key aspect of the Mediterranean diet is lean sources of protein, like chicken and fish, use of olive oil, uh, lots of uh, uh, healthy vegetables, legumes, greens, and it's been associated with less shrinkage of the memory centers. Um, but in addition to the Mediterranean diet, it's also important to watch for salt intake, sugar intake. Uh, and for those who have a little bit more um, strict diets, like vegan, et cetera, just make sure that there's good sources of vitamin B12. Next slide. Another important thing is socializing. Um, there's some evidence that it can actually slow the progression of cognitive decline. You know why that is? Well, you know, when we socialize, our brain releases good chemicals, good hormones for brain health. It helps us maintain focus. Um, it helps us be oriented by having a social schedule. Um, so those are all practical reasons uh, for, for socializing. Next. And the last is cognitive stimulation. Um, I get a lot of questions about what's the right game to play. Should I do this, that, this crossword puzzle, or you know, buy that online, uh, you know, uh, game? Well, I say do what interests you. You're not gonna, you know, <clears throat> if someone isn't into math and you buy them a math game, they're not gonna do it. Um, so you should pick what you like because you're more likely to do it. Uh, but I think the thing is, you should you should mix it up. You should do different forms of that. Uh, of, of, of whatever cognitive activities you're doing. You don't want to do the same crossword puzzle, the same Sudoku all the time. You want to do uh, various types of, of, if you like word puzzles, do, do different versions of it. Uh, if you like card games, play different uh, versions of card games, change up the rules. It's great when it's coupled with socializing as these gentlemen are doing with their card game. And the key thing here is we think it really helps our brain develop new strategies in the face of age-related changes. It's, you're trying to harness unaffected parts of the brain to pick up the slack for those areas that are affected. Next slide. <clears throat> Next is sort of the medical factors that are mod modifiable. And those can be divided into a few categories. So one category that I often ask about and investigate about is sleep. So an insomnia and CF apnea have been shown to be associated with or accelerate the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, factors that affect our cardiovascular and brain vessel health, so blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, diabetes and glucose control. Uh, vitamin deficiencies, um, B12, uh, B1, thiamine is another one. Uh, mood, uh, depression and anxiety, uh, you know, it's very common uh, it, it, to have depression and anxiety. And I think that there's uh, evidence that they're associated with uh, more uh, rapid decline. And so I think it's important to address those, get treatment, whether it's in the form of medication or, or therapy. Uh, endocrine disorders, specifically thyroid, is something good to uh, check for and treat. Uh, and then uh, uh, next slide. Uh, 
something uh, new that's that's come up in recent years is the idea of inflammation. Inflammation being an accelerant towards dementia. And one very practical source of inflammation is our dental health. <clears throat> so there's uh, evidence that overgrowth of certain bacteria in our mouths may be associated with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. And so this encourages uh, us to think of our own teeth, no matter where we stand on the cognitive spectrum. But really for um, dementia patients, people with MCI, they should really um, have their teeth checked or their dentures clean to really reduce that inflammation. Um, good oral health promotes good general health anyways. And even the routine of brushing day and night um, helps with orientation to time. Uh, next slide. Um, I also wanted to touch upon sensory problems. Sensory problems are very common as we get older. Um, cataracts, needing hearing aids. Um, so it's important to <clears throat> always uh, address those and get the treatment that you need for sensory problems. When it comes to hearing, you know, obviously you can't remember what you can't hear. Um, hearing helps us better engage in social settings um, and it enhances our ability to uh, take part in and make use of a cognitive stimulation. And there's even studies showing that hearing impairment left untreated associates with more shrinkage of, of the hippocampus, uh, the memory centers. Next slide. And lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, medication. So, you know, it's important to take the medications that are prescribed uh, by your doctors and take them in the proper way. But it's important to take note that some medications may have an effect on our memory as well and thinking. And so, and especially as we get older, we're on more and more medications. And sometimes this can create something called polypharmacy, uh, too many meds. Um, and the categories of medications that can really <clears throat> affect memory, uh, one are the medications that have anticholinergic side effects. So these are medications that inadvertently uh, affect one of the most important chemicals for memory formation called acetylcholine. And so classically, these medications include the antihistamines, uh, which are used in you know, allergy uh, medicines or even sleep medicines. Um, neurological medicines can sometimes have anticholinergic effects and also some forms of antidepressants, the, tri the tricyclics. Uh, pain medicines or the opiates can, can affect memory. And the benzodiazepines can affect memory. Uh, for example, lorazepam, diazepam, the things that end in uh, uh, PAM. So it's critical to review your medications with your primary doctor and make sure you're on the right ones and that you're taking them in the right way. I always encourage my patients to bring in their bottles so we can really reconcile what's going on. Um, be sure to discuss medications that may impact memory and thinking. And in addition to prescribed medications, <clears throat> I think it's also valuable to uh, list your herbal and supplements uh, as, as, as well, because um, they may also have uh, inadvertent effects on thinking. Next slide. Oh, well, I think that's the end then. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that we've ended with uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, and so thank you very much for uh, listening and I'm happy to uh, field any inquiries. Thank you again, Dr. Mazurker. Um